I want to get weird and talk about hands for a second. You ever notice that Spider-Man and Doctor Strange make similar hand gestures when using their powers? Spidey activates his web shooters by doing this iconic move, and Doctor Strange casts spells with a nearly identical gesture. Even if you've never noticed it, the characters themselves sure have. The miniseries Spider-Man Fever from 2010 is a bizarre supernatural romp with the two characters, ending in this exchange. Hey Doc, that thing you do with your fingers when you zap the magic spells? Yeah, that's it. I kind of do that too when I spray my webbing. Strange, huh? Yes, it is strange. Now, those of you who are especially clever may have already figured out that the answer probably has to do with the fact that Spider-Man and Doctor Strange share a similar lineage. Spidey was co-created by Steve Ditko, whereas Doctor Strange was wholly created by Steve Ditko. Ditko was such an incredibly talented and influential comic book artist that I've been struggling for months to try and make a video that encapsulates everything I want to say about his style and legacy. I'm working on it. I. But at the very least, I think it would be fun to go on a little tangent about the interesting and genuinely brilliant way that Steve Ditko drew hands. I'm sure people will like that. Oh, right. Yeah. No, that makes sense. So I want to start by asking a simple question. Why are hands so freaking hard to draw? Seriously, hands are one of the most challenging things to draw convincingly. I was just talking to an artist friend of mine the other day who was lamenting the pains of drawing these dumb things. Hands are incredibly intricate with the vast number of movements and gestures that they're capable of. Go! Go! Go, Web, go! This one tiny appendage is a complicated system of dozens of moving parts that don't even look like they make sense together. Compared to the rest of the average human body, which is made up of these big, chunky, fairly rigid pieces, hands are an elaborate nightmare. And there's two of them, typically. Plus, your hands are probably the part of your body you see most often in everyday life, not counting your novas, which your brain just kind of filters out until just now when I mentioned it. We're so familiar with our hands that we literally describe how familiar other things are by comparing them to... Just stick with me, kid. I know this town like the back of my hand. Hey, that's new. You get it. All of that to say, hands are complicated, and we know them so well that we can recognize instantly when they don't look right in a drawing. So it makes sense that for a lot of superhero action comics, artists would default into drawing fists or simply keeping the hands small and out of the way most of the time. Jack Kirby, for example, was able to effectively communicate the emotion of a scene through the use of other tactics like dramatic camera angles, exaggerated body language, and energetic facial expressions. On the other hand, Steve did Ditko knew that hands had an untapped potential in the visual language of comics. Ditko brought his characters to life with his carefully observed drawings of hands. His hands express an actor's sense of gesture, missing in even the greatest of superhero artists, serving just as much to render his characters' emotions as their eyes and mouths. Bill Randall, The Comics Journal. The hands Steve Ditko drew were incredibly expressive. They were in your face, and often in characters' faces as well. He loved drawing close-up shots stuffed with his thoughtfully crafted hands that would crowd out the faces in the panel. Hell, sometimes he didn't even use faces at all, and solely relied on hands to tell the whole story of a scene. But I'd argue that even when he did draw characters reacting with dynamic facial expressions, the hands that accompanied them sold the emotion of the moment even better. Without these shaking hands in this panel from the story, Why Won't They Save Me?, this man here looks more bored than nervous. These wild, expressive fingers from The Last Man on Earth emphasize that this guy isn't just alert, but panicked. Or take this panel from the story, Journey's End. This guy here is a murderer on the run who's about to be recognized by a passerby. His facial expression is fine, but it's his hand that really sells the tension for me. He goes from reasonably relaxed in the previous panel to having his fingers rigidly jut out in a tense panic, like he's frozen and trying to decide on his next move, which of course is to violently punch the guy. By the way, these are just three minuscule examples from one single comic, so yeah. There's a whole sea of Ditko hands out there for you to explore, and I encourage you to do so. J. Jonah Jameson, for example, is a dynamic character whose angry, demanding, prideful, conniving personality can be read entirely through his hand gestures alone. 
Honestly, I love this guy, but for the sake of this discussion, it might be more helpful to talk about a character who takes up a small, supporting role in a comic that was otherwise clearly centered around the life and times of J. Jonah Jameson. So let's talk about Spider-Man, I guess. When Spider-Man was introduced in Amazing Fantasy 15, Peter Parker was, of course, bitten on his hand by a radioactive spider that gave him superpowers. The first power he discovered was his ability to cling to walls, shown visually by highlighting his fingertips, imagery that Ditko loved to repeat throughout the wall crawler's adventures. But a spider needs a web, so Peter developed wrist-mounted web shooters that activate with a two-finger tap to the palm like so. Wait! Sorry about that. You know, these web shooters for Spider-Man are kind of awkwardly designed. Like, why did Steve Ditko force Spider-Man to do this hand gesture? There's, there's nothing about that that's inherent to spiders. No, I think he just kind of decided on it by accident. In Ditko's early Spider-Man stories, he only sometimes drew the hero using that iconic hand gesture to activate his web shooters. In most shots, however, Ditko drew Spidey only sticking out his thumb and pointer finger. But when you look through enough of Ditko's bibliography, like I have, you'll start to see an interesting phenomenon in the way that he drew pinkies. The more he draws, the farther characters' pinky fingers start to stick out. It begins subtly, but points out more and more. We're so close, we're almost there, and then suddenly, boom! That pinky's out in the open for the world to see. This pinky out pattern appears everywhere in Steve Ditko's artwork. It's like a hidden signature, a little detail of his art that says, Steve Ditko left his mark here. Here's a scientist doing it for no reason. Here's a businessman grabbing money like this. Here's just some guy knocked on the ground doing Spidey hands. Heck, you can even see it pop up in Spider-Man's origin story before he gets his powers. Oh, and one of Ditko's more political creations called Mr. A, who was an obnoxious character that saw every person and every action in the world as good or evil with no moral gray area, would often strike that finger pose when he dealt out his judgment or threw his calling card at people. Oh, do you get his calling card? It's just black and white. It's, it's so clever. And like, was that intentional? Mr. A dealing out his calling card by striking a finger pose that was basically Steve Ditko's calling card? Did, did you do this on purpose, Steve? So Spider-Man going from this to this could have just been an unintended byproduct of Steve Ditko's artistic pinky quirk. But I don't think the same can be said about Doctor Strange, whose every movement drawn by Ditko was incredibly precise and deliberate. Steve Ditko's art in early Doctor Strange stories obsessed over hands about as much as Stephen Strange himself did. Strange's backstory was as a brilliant but egotistical and wealth-obsessed surgeon who relied on the use of his steady, skillful hands. But after a car crash damaged the nerves in his hands beyond repair, Strange gets the news that he'll never be able to perform an operation again. Not content to be any less than the perfect being he saw himself as before the accident, Strange turns to the mystic arts to heal him, but quickly finds a new purpose in life, defending the Earth from magical threats. Now, okay, the first few stories had Doctor Strange mostly fighting using astral projection or some other kind of magic that didn't involve him moving around too much. But after his origin story was told a few issues later and involved that theme of Strange's whole world revolving around his hands, Ditko made the brilliant decision to, from that point forward, draw spellcasting as requiring precise hand choreography. Although, these magical movements that Ditko drew seem to require a lot more finger guns than the Doctor Strange movie incorporated. All the film did was hire an incredibly talented dancer in a stroke of genius to teach Benedict Cumberbatch intricate finger-tutting maneuvers, but that's not good enough! Sign my petition to add more finger guns to the Doctor Strange sequel! I won't rest until Steve Ditko's dream is realized! 
Ah, in reality, though, Ditko would often furnish Doctor Strange's adventures with mystical elements inspired by real cultures that he'd researched to make sure the world of magic seemed more fleshed out. I'm by no means an expert on the subject, but a follower on Twitter sent me information about mudras, which are spiritual hand and finger gestures used in Hinduism and Buddhism. Specifically, it seems the Spider-Man-like pose that Doctor Strange strikes resembles the Karana Mudra, which is said to expel demons and remove obstacles like illness. Wait, hold on. But expel demons and remove illness? That's starting to sound a lot like... So, we're ending where we started. With this little-known comic called Spider-Man Fever. This three-issue story involves Spidey getting sprayed with insecticide and succumbing to, you guessed it, a fever, while deliriously stumbling into a bathtub. But it's not just any bathtub, it's Doctor Strange's bathtub. And he accidentally unleashed a bunch of demons recently who then steal Spider-Man's soul as he lies there helplessly recovering from getting sprayed with bug spray. God, I love it when comics escalate into madness immediately. Also, I could be wrong, but this is the only comic I'm aware of where Spider-Man and Doctor Strange comment on how their hand gestures are similar, and it's a story blatantly about Doctor Strange warding off demons and curing Spider-Man of illness, two things that the Karana Mudra is used for. That's clever writing on the part of the series author, Brendan McCarthy, who also illustrated the story. You can tell that he was tapping into Ditko's trippy, psychedelic artwork of abstract, otherworldly dimensions, too. The visuals in this comic were meant to evoke Ditko's surreal art, which were massively influential for countless comics creators. Which brings us back to this panel. The final panel of the series where Spider-Man and Doctor Strange compare their similar hand gestures. The image in the background of this panel is a classic visual from Strange Tales number 138. While Ditko's entire run on Doctor Strange was immeasurably influential, this image in particular left such an impact on readers that the MCU even recreated it for the movie as a little easter egg. Putting this iconic Ditko imagery in the background of the panel is meant to showcase the link between Spider-Man and Doctor Strange. Hands that are similar by coincidence, but still represent a connected past, tracing back to the hands that created them. We can even see what looks to be the backs of Stan Lee and Steve Ditko as onlookers a few panels earlier. Stan's hand on Ditko's shoulder with his pinky slightly out as if to pay tribute to the hands of a legendary artist. Hey Doc, that thing you do with your fingers when you zap the magic spells? Yeah, that's it. I kind of do that too when I spray my webbing. Strange, huh? Yes, it is strange. Also, it's worth noting that Steve Ditko worked in just like terrible political and moral beliefs into his comic books, and I am I I'm making a video about it. I promise. It's just, you know, look, I disagree with the guy on everything, pretty much. But he drew good hints, and I don't know. I feel like it's worth talking about that idolizing him. Hey, so this is the weirdest video I've ever made. Sorry it took so long. Also, apologies for this really bad audio in the outro here. Uh, some of you know this, I moved recently. I don't have everything set up, so I'm just recording this on my phone in a very echoey room. Enjoy! Uh, if you really like what I do, consider supporting me monthly on Patreon, or you can make a one-time donation through PayPal. I could have made a joke about lending a hand, but I didn't. You're welcome. Thanks to all who already support me, especially Christopher Lang, Laurie Timms, Billy Bombs, Everett Parrot, Havelock Smiggles, Jack Bushnell, Jonathan and Megan Pearson, Jonathan Lenowski, Sonali Manka, and the rest of the wonderful nerds who support me over at patreon.com slash nerdsync. Click or tap right here to see a video about the real origin of J. Jonah Jameson. I think that's a fun one. Uh, once again, my name is Scott, reminding you to read between the panels and grow smarter through comics. See ya. Tony Stark's identity is at risk. Yours could be too.